All right, what's up, everybody? We are here for another Midwest Swing podcast and simulcast on Periscope. We call it Midwest Swing Live. I am your host, Brandon Warren. Thank you for hanging out with me on a Sunday evening, Father's Day evening. The first Father's Day I've ever had where I've been a father. Pretty cool, if you ask me, which I think a lot of people would agree with. And uh, yeah, so we're just going to chat a little bit about the Twins, about the four-game sweep they took at the hands of the Cleveland Indians. We can talk about the Seattle series if people want. We can talk about the White Sox coming into town. I do have Dan Hayes of CSN Chicago coming on the show on Tuesday to talk about, who knows, maybe uh, Mike Pelfrey. We'll talk a little bit about James Shields coming back to the rotation, how far away Carlos Rodon is, what's going on with Jose Quintana and why he's struggling so much, if Avisail Garcia is for real, why Jose Abreu is struggling a little bit of late. We can talk about a lot of things. If you are new to the program, please, 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 to, to, to let you know how this all works, send your questions to me on Twitter, at Brandon underscore Warren. I will answer them there. You can submit them in the app, like always, but if I don't see them or if I'm in the middle of a rant and don't get a chance to remember them, then I will probably not be able to answer them in a timely or uh, legitimate fashion. So... Send me those questions, otherwise we can break down what was a fairly decent start by Kyle Gibson today, going six innings, three earned runs, a couple home runs allowed to the Edwin, Edwin Encarnacion, and um, you know, not a not a great series for the Twins in 14 and two-thirds innings, just one run for the Twins offense against Indians relievers. And I think the worst part was that most of it was against guys like Nick Goody and Dan Otero and uh, the Boone Logan, you know, not necessarily Andrew Miller, not necessarily Cody Allen, although they did see each of those guys in the series. But, you know, if you're going to get shut down by the Indians' bullpen, you're really going to prefer that it be the big wigs rather than the guys at the front of the bullpen, the Zach McAllisters of the world. And a lot of people will be quick to say, well, well, the Twins' pitching rotation wasn't lined up. Neither was Cleveland's, quite frankly. When you think about the fact that Carlos Carrasco is good, although his command was scattershot a little bit on Thursday night, it's uh, you know, it's um, it's really inexplicable that the Twins couldn't get to Ryan Merritt, who is just a wolf in, in uh, sheep's clothing, as far as Adam Wilk is concerned. You know, I know he had that great game in the ALCS last year. Uh, got four and a third innings against the Blue Jays. But he's he's by no means a stud. And I thought it was actually brilliant, Terry Francona bringing in Zach McAllister right after the fact. You go from a guy throwing 86 to a guy throwing 96, and you know the Twins hitters, Brian Dozier especially, will say, you know, it does, we got to execute. It doesn't mess with us that much. I think that there's some gamesmanship there. It's the same reason why you will have a long guy that is opposite-handed come in on a short start. If, if, for instance, Adam Wilk had that short start, your long guy is Alex Wimmers. Because you're, if, if the other team, especially with how teams construct lineups nowadays, you know, uh, Joe Madden used to hit guys like Jeff Kepinger third, while well, Kepinger mauled lefties. Well, if, if a quick guy, uh, if a guy quick gets the gate in, uh, in the game, then when you bring in someone who's of the other handed, handedness, you can mess with those splits a little bit in that. That lineup is constructed to face a specific handed pitcher, and then uh, later in the game it can be messed with a little bit. It's not, I don't know, it's not, uh, again, if you're down five, six runs, it's it's not going to get you back in the game. But there is some gamesmanship at play there. So I, I really thought McAllister threw the ball well. Um, I actually thought Nick Turley, and I, I know uh, it sounds like I'm his, his agent or something, but 95 from the left side you can't teach. And so I do think that eventually... You know, if he can't hack it in the rotation, and we don't know that he can't yet. It's only been two starts. The breaking ball has been spotty to this point. But if he can get that breaking ball over, you may have a starter. If he can't, or if he, if it's, uh, you know, ineffective or, or location is ineffective, then I think you're looking at a guy who will work in the bullpen. And, and again, this bullpen is, is, is not very good. It's not only not very good, but it's not very deep. Tyler Duffy came into today's game at I think 32 innings pitched on the year, and he was like, um, I think there was only 15 or 17 pitchers ahead of him as far as relievers in innings pitched. And so, um, you know, 
in 24 games, he's thrown like 30-some innings. That means that they're using him up, soaking him up pretty good. We don't know how he's going to bounce back. Again, he's conditioned to be a reliever from his time back with Rice. But again, I don't know that he's going to be able to give them 80 innings at the level that he has so far. So, I don't know. I mean, they really do need to, to make that bullpen deeper. And they did make a, a step in the right direction by bringing up Booznitz. Now, I don't think sending out Ryan Presley was the right move. But again, that's not up to me. Um, but when I when I saw that he had gotten sent out and then saw him come into the clubhouse, um, he looked fairly upset, which Molitor said, you know, what, what do you expect from a guy who's thrown the ball the way he has here the last two days getting sent out? And Presley kind of has an intense look on his face at all times anyway. But I just didn't understand that move at all. Uh, Presley is part of what you need to establish in this bullpen right now. And, and he's going to give you something more than what some of your veteran guys are that you can't trust in those situations. Anyway, you can't trust Presley in the eighth inning yet either. I can, I can justifiably say that, but you're going to trust him sooner than you are Craig Breslow or a Matt Belisle. And the other thing is, it's not like Presley has anything really to learn. It's more execution. And so at his age, and I think he's, is he 27 or something? Sending him down to waste bullets at AAA Rochester just does not does not resonate with me in a positive sense. And so I I just don't like the move because, again, I think he was close to back. The curveball looked pretty good when he came back up. The fastball was, you know, was popping pretty good. And I just, um, you got to use him up. Just like Mike Berardino and I have said on shows before, with these relievers, you know, bullpen guys um, have a limited shelf life and you need to use them up when they're ready. Getting Boosnitz up here is the step in the right direction. However, however, by kicking Presley out, I think you're taking two, step, uh, two steps forward and then three steps back. So I don't know that that's, uh, that's a great idea. Matt Trueblood, uh, a good buddy of mine who I saw at the Twins game in the Mariners series, asking, would I cut Breslow at this point? I think I would. My running theory is... If you have an eight-man bullpen, and I, I'd be hard-pressed to remember if it's still eight. I think it's seven now. But the, the trouble is they don't use the closer much outside the ninth inning. You can't trust Belial. You can't trust Breslow. You can't trust... Who else are we missing here? You can't trust Wimmers, who they sent back. And then there was a stretch where you couldn't trust Heston. You're not going to trust Boosnitz. Basically, it's down to Duffy who you can trust, who's been hit hard lately. Uh, still still fairly good numbers, but is, is starting to show a little bit of wear and tear, which I think is, is to be expected. Uh, it's Duffy, it's Rogers, and it's Buddy Bo Shears, who everyone consistently dogs on to me, that they're able to trust in the 7th and 8th inning of the game as well. Uh, it doesn't matter when you drop four in a row to the Cleveland Indians. You, you're, you've got all hands on deck just trying to get through games. That's when Taylor Rogers throws the ninth inning. And Brandon Kinsler today throwing the ninth inning, you know, uh, you know, all that's all hands on deck. That's not leverage. That's getting out of, um, getting out of the game unscathed or with, uh, you know, with um, all the deck chairs still on the deck, so to speak. Um, so I would probably do more of a wide. Again, this is me with no skin in the game saying this, but I think I would probably just do a wide sweeping, um, in or out. As far as uh, bringing up Hildenberger, bringing up Malatakis once he's ready, bring up Curtis, and then just swap out the guys who are up there as kind of like the coach slash, um, you know, the ineffective guys. Uh, I go back and forth on Belial, but honestly, I just don't think that it's a, it's a good fit right now. And, um, and it's just time to move on and find out what you have in these guys who you have in the minors who can help you. Again, Boosnet's going to be 27 soon. Hildenberger's not a kid. Um, Curtis is not a kid. Melitakis is not a kid. I see you, Plumpy. I know why you think I'm cute. Hi. Um, all these guys aren't kids, and so it's time to just get get on with it with some of these guys. And, um, you know, Shagwa being hurt hurts a lot as well. Sorry to double down on the word hurt there. But um, if you're not going to be good and the bullpen's not good. You should at least be young or you should at least be interesting. There's too much on this bullpen right now that isn't good, young, or interesting. And um, again, I, 
th there's probably things in the dynamic of building a bullpen that I don't understand, but uh, I just got to, you know, I think we got to see some of these guys that don't have time in the big leagues yet. And I think Hildenberger might be my first guy. And Buznets looked good, I thought, in the, the nightcap of Saturday, uh, 90, 96, as high as 97. The curve looked fairly good. Uh, the slider got him bit a little bit, but honestly, I think that... Uh, I think that um, the slider got got hit by uh, by Lindor. Lindor's a dude. Lindor's awesome. And so the fact that you threw four sliders to him and he hits a home run in the fourth one, that's that's understandable. Again, if you're going to give up a home run, it might as well be to one of their best guys. So I thought Buznitz was was good. I think he's got potential to be uh, someone who can help them. And again, for six years, he's cheap. Might as well see what he's got. Um, but then you spend the next six weeks evaluating what these guys can do, and not only what these guys can do, but then where you're at around the time of the deadline to see if you need to go outside the organization. For instance, somebody in the chat asked if Pat Nishak or Brad Hand could help them. Um, incidentally, both Minnesota guys, but two totally different price points, too. I'm not sure I want to trade with A.J. Preller on a guy like Brad Hand who sort of came out of nowhere. I mean, he was nasty in high school. But uh, but sort of came out of nowhere, and then he wants you to pay up with some prospects. That's that reeks of Boston Red Sox to me. The Tyler Thornburg Carson Smith situation, and so I just, I'd try to stay away from that. If you could get Nishek for like a Daniel Palka or a, you know an organizational type pitcher, um, not necessarily a Sleegers, but maybe uh, you know someone right around there, you know someone that the Phillies might find a little more interesting, then I might consider it because. Um, you know, we'll we'll see what happens. But honestly, I, I don't believe in going out and giving up anything uh, worth of value for relievers because, first of all, I mean, nishek has got durability. We don't know about Hand right now. Hand would be uh, like like the second coming of Glenn Perkins. We've all seen how that's going right now, which is not a slight against Glenn. It's just that guys wear down. And so um, it's to, to me, it's just a uh, it, it, there's an issue with putting too many assets that uh, can help you elsewhere more stably. I don't know if stable is a word. It probably isn't. Uh, you know, the, you know, it, it's, it's putting your, your eggs in the basket of relievers when, um, you know, like the argument I had with Sod Jacket about trading Trevor Plouffe for relievers. So, I mean, who are you going to get for Trevor Plouffe? Are you going to get Jim Hoey and Brett Jacobson? I mean, come on. The, uh, the odds of the, um, you know, the odds of getting any useful relievers for Trevor Plouffe uh, before last season, uh, you know, th those relievers probably wouldn't even be on the team anymore. So, um, and, be, and not only that, but but Miguel Sano hadn't played third base full time in over a year. You needed insurance beyond Eduardo Escobar. So, you know, they, and they were counting on him to play short. So, uh, not not to get off on a tangent, but I just I don't feel like it's a good idea to make all these trades for relievers when uh, you know I think this team's got bigger issues. And to the to the other point too, the people have asked me. Do you, do you make a trade for a starter? Well, again, I don't know that this team is one starter away from wherever these fans think they're going. You know, names that come up. Chris Archer, the Twins ab absolutely should not pay what it costs to get him. Not because he's not a stud, but because the Twins are going to need Nick Gordon, Steven Gonzalez, Fernando Romero, whoever else the, the Rays might ask for. The Twins are probably going to need those guys in the next three to five years, or two to three years, frankly to get wherever they're headed with this new front office. And so I, I just, I'm, I'm not really in on the big trades. Uh, another name that got floated to me today was Jaime Garcia. Semi-interesting lefty, only 30, believe it or not, which is weird because we've been talking about him forever. But um, if the price is low, and I'm not certain that it would be, uh, he's been good. Uh, crazy ground ball rate. He's been good over his last four or five starts. But... You know, if you want to talk about the volatility of relievers, take a look at a guy who's had shoulder issues left and right. Uh, well, exclusively left based on handedness. But look at a guy who's, whose shoulder has bothered him so much at points in his career where he's been on the disabled list almost as much as he's pitched. So I really don't think Jaime Garcia is an answer. And, and again, I think it more speaks to the fact that pitchers are just so volatile. You know, relievers are another level as far as few innings and, and you know like we've seen with Matt Belisle this year giving up more earned runs this year than the last two years combined he's been terrible this year he was okay the last two years he had some injuries whatever but the volatility of relievers gets ramped up because of the compactedness of their usage 
So a three-run outing in one-third of an inning will mess up your ERA for a month or three weeks or whatever. Um, with starters, again, you're, you're, now you're running into risks of years of control and, and finances, and then what happens if they get hurt. And With Garcia, the, the risk there of him getting hurt again, to me, screams of the Braves taking advantage of the Twins here, which I don't like. Uh, I did see someone ask me the odds of Brian Dozier being on the Twins come, I think they said September 1st, but even August 1st is a valid question. Um, I, I I don't have a number, and I'm, I'm taking the Mike Berardino approach on this one because he will oftentimes not go with a number, but I think it's higher than people think that they would trade Dozier, Santana. Santiago, I think, could be as good as God if, if he comes back and pitches well. But I don't think these guys are going to be in the business of shying away from unpopular decisions because they were brought in to win. They were brought in to do whatever it takes. And if Irvin Santana can bring you back two top 100 prospects, I'm not saying he can, but just hypothetically here, whatever the whatever the threshold that they set for an Irvin Santana trade, you basically you put the, the sign up on the in the in the yard. If somebody comes to your house, makes you that offer, you let them go. And if somebody doesn't, again, like I've said in previous editions of this show, if people don't meet your price and his arm falls off the next day, it's not the end of the world. It's not like year two of the Joe Maurer contract or if Max Scherzer's arm were to fall off tomorrow. That would be a much bigger deal. Same thing with Dozier. Again, it's not preferable. You don't, you certainly wouldn't want it to happen. But if if for any reason that Brian Dozier or Urban Santana don't give the Twins any more value for the rest of their contract, you wouldn't be up the creek. You wouldn't have to reboot your franchise. You'd be okay. Uh, fans would be upset that um, fans would be upset that you didn't maximize the value when you had the chance because hindsight is twenty twenty and fans don't understand that. But as an organization, you wouldn't feel rattled to your core. So to that end, I think you set again. You set the sign in the ground. Figure out what you need um, as far as who you might like from certain teams that might be interested, and 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 go from there. And it shouldn't matter whether you're five games over, five games under, or in between the two come July 31st or even mid-July if teams start coming um, and maybe there's an injury or something. You have to be prepared as far as what uh, what you're willing to do. Grant Spears, oh, excuse me, got, got something in my throat. Uh, Grant Spears wants to know about uh, Fernando Romero getting up there in innings. Do you move him to the bullpen to save some innings? Uh, personally, I think you probably have to. Um but I, I, I think it makes more sense to do that than to shut him down. You either have to move him to the bullpen or start skipping starts for him, which is, um, I don't know, it's uh, it's inexplicable because you want to keep the innings count up a little bit so that he keeps progressing to the point where when he's in the big leagues, he gives you 160 or 170 innings uh, or whatever you're looking for based on how well he pitches that first year. And so you've got to be careful about giving him too much time off or, or doing that arbitrary cutoff like the Nationals did with Strasburg. And, and and a lot of times when you shut guys down, it doesn't help anyway. I'm not saying it can't help, but we've said we've seen that sometimes it, it doesn't matter because the pitching arm is a finicky thing either way. So um, I think they probably have to pull back in some way, shape, or form. Um, Matt Trueblood says, Do you sense there's a chance they call up Gordon to take over at short, even failing a Dozier deal? No, because I think there's a growing sense in the community, both in the Twins community and at large, that he's not going to be a shortstop moving forward. He has been outshined at short, in my opinion and from what I've heard, by Angel Vielma. And, um, you know, Vielma, if he continues to hit even a little bit, could be a younger version of A. Ray Adrianza, who's a decent player. And actually, somebody asked me about Adrianza earlier in the chat uh, Steven Risotto, so we'll chat about him as well. But if if Vielma gives you something as far as the bat, let's just say a 700 OPS, you might have a Jose Iglesias on your hands, which, you know, um, you look for more offensive-minded player. But based on talking to Mike Berardino, talking to some people in Chattanooga, the the feeling is that he's he's not natural enough at short, or he, he gets outshined by guys who are very, very accomplished at the position. Now, that's not to say he can't work his way out of that. That's not to say that he should be measured by the stick of the best defensive infielder in the entire system. But uh, 
I just I don't think he's got the chops to to leapfrog the guys in place. I think Polanco is the better defender at short right now. Um, he's taken some very significant strides. I don't know what's happened with the bat, which is uh, which is really inexplicable. But I still think there's a good player in there. He makes contact. He hits it in the air. He does not strike out, and he walks a fair amount. I still think there's a good player in there. Um, no matter if it plays at, at short or second, but it, it is a little bit disappointing to uh, to see where he's gone to this point in the season. Doubles wants to know, does Eddie Rosario, he says Cheech Rosario, which makes me giggle a little bit, have a long-term future here? Some days he's really good, but other days, holy cow. Yeah, his OPS was up in like the 770 range coming into today, and then you see in this series two critical base running errors. First of all, tagging from first to go to second, on that fly ball to Robertson. I believe it was in the first game of the series. And then today, getting caught in between first and second on a throw coming home. Both of those plays have their place in games. Now, don't get me wrong. We used to see Michael Kadair do it, where you draw that throw so that the run comes in to score, and you give up your out. I don't love that play. I've never loved that play, but I've understood that it's part of the game. I still don't think it makes any sense to me, because I don't know. I just don't like it. But then... Um, Tagging up from first on a fly ball to deep left. It was like back against the wall for Robertson. And then Robertson comes up with an absolute P-rod to throw him out. The issue with that was the timing. Not about the execution, not about, or not necessarily the execution or even the process. It was the timing. The Twins were down four runs at the time, I believe. Or it might have been three. I think it was 4-0. And it just did not make sense to, to, to risk that out on the bases there when you're down by four. So again... The bat has really come around lately, and maybe it was a three-run home run or three-home run game that really gave him that boost. But I mean, right now he's hitting 272, 310, 460 for his three slashes. Um, you know, if not for Eduardo Escobar, we'd be talking more about his up and comingness offensively. And he's had stretches where he's done a better job of taking walks. He's already walked as many times as he did all last year, which is uh, which is pretty amazing. Of course, it's only I think 12 times, but. He's at like a 5.4% walk rate, which is is not too bad. So, you know, um, I think the tools are there. Somebody asked if he'll play more than Zach Granite over the next three years. Um, I certainly believe so. I don't know if Zach Granite will be more than Jason Tyner. Um, I hope that he is, but I don't know that he will be. So so we'll see if, if he's more than Jason Tyner. As a pinch runner, fourth outfielder, defender who makes a lot of contact, maybe he's another Ben Revere. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think he's going to hit for any power, and so that significantly limits him to center field for me or uh, a very second division left field profile. So I don't think they're going to push Eddie Rosario aside. However, um, it might make Robbie Grossman more of a, a DH type, which, again, nothing wrong with that. And if Vargas continues to struggle, his OBP is down to 276, you could see that move. Obviously, the, the hitting streak was ex um, expired today. Uh, it was 20 or 17 games, I think. And so it's very clear, good back to ball skills, can get on base a little bit, can really run. Those guys have value as fourth outfielders who can spell you across all three positions. I, d I don't know enough about his arm to know about right, but they've got enough arm and athleticism to, to mix and match however they want to do that. All right, let's see what else we got here before we're done. Um, we do have, I know we had a question. Uh, we, we had Adrianza. Maybe I'm just maybe I'm just missing here. I thought Devlin Clark had asked a question, and now I'm missing it. Um, yeah, apparently I'm missing it. Well, if you got any more questions, we get we'll take we have time to take one more question. So whoever's question is next will get answered. Otherwise, we're going to wrap it up here. You guys have been great. What a great show. I appreciate it very much. I got a timer about to go off for an alarm on my phone, so I'm about to get in trouble. <laughs> oh hey yeah okay so Paul Murphy is asking, uh, Coke or Pepsi, I'm going to say Coke. Uh, Paul Murphy is asking about the luck of the Red Sox in um, the issues with Thornburg and Carson Smith. Now, th there is some bad luck. I will grant that. I will absolutely grant that there was bad luck. But again, that's, that's the risk you take with making trades of everyday players for relievers. Travis Shaw, everyday player. Mauricio Dubon, everyday player. So I think that it's... Uh, <laughs> Um, I think it's it's just part of the risk. And the Twins, 
have have had that risk before with the trade of J.J. Hardy and as well the trade of um, Wilson Ramos, who wasn't played yet this year, but has been um, you know a, a fairly good catcher since he left. So uh, I just I don't like the idea at uh, I, I don't like the idea of trading position players. Oh, yeah, Chi Wei Hu who was a pitcher, but a, a very young one for Kevin Jepsen. Also didn't like that trade either. Um, but I understood it at the time, at least. So, uh, honestly, I just think that uh, I would stay away from those kind of deals. And I would go with, uh, you know, with, with cheaper options. And maybe that's just that's just me. All right, we ran a little over time. Hopefully, it'll still upload onto YouTube. Look on YouTube, the Cole Omaha channel. For these videos, check out Midwest Swing on iTunes, Libsyn, Stitcher, Google Play, Wherever you get your podcasts at, you can find it on there. Thanks for joining us. Midwest Swing Live, part of the Cold Omaha Podcast Network. Peace.